Good morning. Welcome to worship. We give thanks to God that the Holy Spirit has gathered you to, into worship today to receive the good news that we are inheritors of the kingdom of God, which is a kingdom of grace and mercy for each and every one of us. I want to welcome any visitors that are with us for the first, second, third, fourth, fifth time. Um, you're always welcome here. If you want to fill out a, a slip in front of you, one of the blue slips, so I can then contact you later, um, up to you. You can also just be here in worship as we've been gathered um, by God. Some announcements of this next week or so. Um, Monday and Tuesday of this next week, we're going to have a work party here starting at 9 a.m. to begin work on the sheds in, the, in our, the back part of our property. And so we need all the help we can get. So if you're available for that, please come to church on Monday and Tuesday. Then we will also be having a summer picnic next Sunday after worship at 1130 um, uh, out on Deer Island. The, not, on the top part of our insert is here. Everybody's welcome. If you want to plan on bringing something, you can sign up. But if you are wanting to just come, we want to have as many people from Creator or any of you who are um, here today as visitors are also, of course, welcome. This coming Saturday, we will be have, having um, the funeral for, for Robert Hook, and so there will be some setup that we'll need on Friday, and then the funeral itself is on Saturday. Then the last thing I wanted to highlight was Theology on Taps. Our second one of the summer will be at the Nye Home on on August 18th, and we'll be talking about priesthood of all believers. It's one of the, those Lutheran catchphrases from 1 Peter um, chapter 2 about how we are all called in different ways to um, proclaim and share the gospel. Nancy, do you have an announcement? Yes, Kathy. Wonderful. Okay. For those of you who are worshiping um, digitally, we will our hymn of the day will be a new one to us, and that means we'll we'll Nancy will play through once, and then we'll sing and do our best, and we'll put it in again in a few weeks. So we have to practice it, and then also the Lion for Kids event is at the end of August, and that's in your announcements that you should have in your email or on our website if you'd like more information about that. And Kim, what do you have for us? So we have some we have some boxes. We, um, part of our, our, our well, congregation decided to spend down some of our general balance in opportunities to enrich our ministry and our physical space as well. So one of that is we got some countertops and cabinets that are currently in the bubble room in boxes, and we need to move them into room four to be prepared for the funeral this weekend. So after worship, anybody who's willing to lug some boxes. Um, meet in the bubble room and move the things over. I want to also highlight, speaking of that, Sue today is in one of our new ch chairs with arms. We've got one of them assembled. You can stay seated. <laughs> we will be assembling in the other seven. 
Also, that's another one. If anybody else wants to help assemble chairs and is good at, that's one of your spiritual gifts of like understanding schematics with screws and things like that. I know it's not everybody's spiritual gift, so. <laughs> Ikea. No, they're not actually Ikea, but um, there's seven more to assemble, and that's one of the things that we also use some of that, the, the congregational funds for, for our members to be able to be a little safer and more secure in worship as, as we our bodies need that. Um, and then also take a peek in the multi-purpose room. There's a new television there that we can cast to, and the speakers actually work in there now. And we're working on getting a microphone and a way to record um, classes so that when we have a, a guest or when we want to put things online, we can do that. So those things that we voted on in June are starting to happen around here, which is really good news. I think those are all of our announcements, so please rise as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. We worship in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us. We place our hope in you. Our innermost being waits for you, O Lord. You are our helper and our shield. Our hearts rejoice in you. In your holy name, we put our trust. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us. We place our hope in you. We continue with our gathering song. Trusting God's promise of forgiveness, let us confess our sin against God and one another. Eternal God, our creator and redeemer, in you we live and move and have our being. Look upon us, your children, the work of your hands. Forgive us all our offenses and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, our refuge and our strength. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's grace has been poured into our hearts, creating them anew through the Holy Spirit. In the mercy of Almighty God, Christ died for you while you were still a sinner. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, you sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church. Open our hearts to the riches of your grace that we may be ready to receive you wherever you appear. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. First reading is from Genesis, the 15th chapter. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from Hebrew, the 11th chapter. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith he received power of procreation, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren because he considered him faithful who had been promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith without having received the promises but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. The word of the Lord. I'd like to invite the children that are with us today to come forward for a children's sermon. As you are comfortable. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? Let's go to check in. Two thumbs up, one thumb up, kind of, I don't know. Okay. 
Well, good to have you here. I, uh, today in our gospel lesson, we're going to hear about a bunch of commands from Jesus, but then also a one that I want to kind of um, pull out. It says, seek. Have you ever played hide and seek? Yeah. How do you play hide and seek? And then so, uh, so you count and everybody hides, and then you stay hidden? So that's the hide part. Where's the, how, does, how does the seek part work? And somebody tries to find you? Okay, so if you're the seeker, your goal is to find everybody, right? What if it happens if you don't find somebody? They just stay hidden forever? You give up and say, everybody come out, I give up, you win? Okay. And so the, see, the, the hiders, do they want to be found or not? They don't, don't want to be found. Hide and seek doesn't have an end. He is good at hiding. Don't. He hid in a closet, and I looked in the closet, and I still didn't even find him. I don't know how this works. Did you know that, that God plays hide and seek? Yeah? You didn't know God plays hide and seek? Do you know that God is actually here in the sanctuary and wants us to find, and in our world, but wants us to find God in where God wants to be found for us as a promise. Because in the whole world, God created everything, right? So everywhere is God's fingerprints of what God did and is continuing to do for us as the corn grows and as the sunflowers are starting to, to be opened up. God is working and doing all those things. But God wants to be found as a promise in certain places. So God will hide until we, f we are in places where God wants us to find him. So let's see where God is hiding in the sanctuary. Do you want to see where God's hiding in the sanctuary? Okay. Any idea? You can't see God. God's invisible. How do we see God? Where's God's hiding? Do you think God's under the chair? No, God's not under the chair. Do you think God is behind the sound booth with Andy and, Sh and Sherry? Do you think God's there? Where does God want to be found? Yeah? Well, I have some very specific places where God wants to be found, okay? One place where God wants to be found is right here. You know why? When I preach God's word, that is God's promise for us. That is Jesus actually being preached when I preach a good sermon about how much God loves us. I mean, I can be up here just talking, right? There are some preachers that don't do their job and don't give the word of God. But when I tell you that, you know, we need to be forgiven and God's grace is for us, that's a sermon, and that's Jesus being found. And right under here, in some of our other places, there's, there's these. What are these? Bibles. Have you seen these before? So how can God be found in these? Just by looking at the book? Oh, that's a nice book. Put it on a shelf. What do you have to do? You have to look, just look at them. Oh, that looks a nice lot of words. You have to read them. Oh, okay. And you see as you read them how God has worked in the world. So that's another way that God wants to be found. Do you think any other places? Up here? God wants to be found up here? What's up here for God? Is it God underneath this table? Oh, in communion. And what is communion? Some of you know the body and blood of Jesus given, and these are the important words, for you, right? They're for you. So God wants to be found here too because here God is promised. What promise do we get up here? We get forgiveness, right? And there's, one other, there's two more places I want to show you where God is. God's also right here. Hiding in the water. What? God's in the water? How do we find God in the water? Can you find God in Lake Taps? It's really cold, right? I mean, oh, this water with the word of God. And then you're baptized and become a children of God. So God wants to be found here, too, where we are become children of God. Now, there's another text that I have on my wall at home. It says, where two or three are gathered, I, in my name, I am with you. 
So there's a key here, in my name. So if there's two or three of you, just like, let's say, um, walking on the sidewalk. It's true that God is there, but what makes um, in my name happen? You talk about God with each other. Have you ever talked about God outside of church with anybody? Never? You've never talked at home about God or to question? <laughs> at home you do sometimes, right? You have two parents who are pastors. You're kind of uh, stuck with that. Yeah. <laughs> But have you ever prayed before a meal with somebody? Yeah? So God is there too. And guess what? Look it up. Are there two or three people here? Yeah. I think there's a few more than two or three. And are we in the, in gathering in God's name? We did, right? Because I began the service in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we're talking about God. So God wants to, us to find God here in worship too, where God has promised for us. Church is God's home, and we are God's home too. Do you think God only lives in the church, though? That's why it's important, that last one. Because, and is the Bible only read in church? No, it's at your house. It's at your house, too. So those are yeah. the places where God goes with you. And once you're baptized, God goes with you. And we can share that good news with other people. So it might seem like, where is God? God is not necessarily, we're not going to see like a little ghost hiding under the chair, right? That's not what God does. We can't see that. God is with us all, but where we hear God's word and we eat and we feel, God is there for us as a promise. And I know it's a little different to think about it that way, but when you think about hide and seek, think about, I'm not going to seek God in places that are horrible in the sense of God's doing this, but I'm going to seek God as, how is God a promise for me there? How is God helping me here? And that's where you can start seeing where God is for you in all places as a promise, okay? I want you to mill that over in your heads, okay? And if you have any questions, you can ask your parents. <laughs> and then you can also ask me, okay? Because I want you all to think and to know more and more and more about God's promises. That's what it means to seek the kingdom, not that you have to find some hidden kingdom in the world somewhere that nobody else knows about, but seeking the kingdom is learning more and more and more about God and more and more about how God is a promise and loves each and every one of us. Okay, here we pray. Dear Jesus, help us play hide and seek in the way that you want us to. Help us seek you in your word and in baptism and in blessings, and in one another so that we can share your love and hope with one another. Help us to know that you are for us and that you are with us. And all God's children said, Amen. You may return to your seats. Please rise for our gospel acclamation. Our Holy Gospel lesson today comes from Luke, the 12th chapter. Lord, Lord. Jesus said, Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, 
he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know about you, but this text has a lot of commands in it. <laughs> a lot of this, like, don't be afraid, little flock, and then do all of these things. Sell all your possessions, make all these things right, be dressed for actions, have your land lipped, and be ready to open the door. It seems exhausting. And it seems like a lot of things that we must do in order to find or have or receive this promise of God. And that is our, our lens of the law, the lens of the world that tells you that you have to earn and you have to do, you must make all of this happen for yourself. For one thing, that's not the context actually of this text. I'm going to read the few verses of before this text for you all. Let's see. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not keep striving for what you are to eat or what you are to drink, and do not keep worrying. For it is the nations of the world that strive after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and all these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock. Very different, isn't it? So do not worry about your life. <laughs> hmm. Do not worry about what you will eat or your body or what you will wear, if a wild flower is adorned and it's just a day there for a day and then thrown into the fire or thrown into the compost heap, in my case, and yet it's beloved by God, how much more value do you have? Your Father in Heaven knows what you need and your Father in Heaven is a provider. So seek first His kingdom and all things will be given to you. We are called to live in faith. And yet we quickly go into the commands. But before we do that, I want you to think. Look backwards in your life. Think about what you've been through in your life and the worries that you've carried in certain times of your life. I bet at the moment they were actually happening, it felt like, how am I going to get through this? I'm worried about everything. I'm worried about my life. Where is God in this? But when we can look backwards, we do begin to see that hand of God working and providing for us to get to today. And I'm sure if you are at all breathing and human, you have worries today, right? You're probably worried about relationships, work, um, finances, your body, what you will eat, what you will wear, your isolation, all these things. So we are here in this moment. And then I bet if you look forward to the future, fear and trepidation perhaps, wondering what will happen. So sometimes we need to look back, and as the Hebrews did, look backwards and walk, forward, back, walk backwards into the future. That's what they actually did in the, in the Israelite time. They, they look backwards and they walk into the future looking at how God has been faithful. So they can't see what's coming, but they know that God has been faithful in ages past. Therefore, God will be faithful in years to come. The faithfulness of God is something to put before us at all times because in the moments we live now, there are a lot of fear. How often, after all, do you go out looking for what you've already been given? You are like sheep who wander off looking for food. 
looking for safety, looking for companionship, and you already have those. Maybe they take a little work, <laughs> but you already have all that you need in your life. We are already provided for, for our shepherd, and so we go off looking in the wrong places rather than looking where God has promised for us, rather than realizing how God has already provided for us. We are more important to God than the flowers of the field. And God wants to give you the kingdom. It pleases God to do this. And guess what? God doesn't only just want to give you the kingdom. He doesn't even ask you if you want it. He simply gives it to you. Not if you do things right, not even if you're a good sheep who never wanders off, but God gives you the kingdom, period. End of sentence. Nothing required of you. And yet, we hear these next commands that come in the text as, I must do this. We hear them as conditional to keep or retain the promise of God. So I need to sell all my possessions. So it just said, it's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom and then sell your possessions, give alms, make purses that don't wear out and do all these things correctly. Make sure your heart's in the right place. And all of a sudden, this guillotine of the law comes down and we start thinking that it's a conditional thing that God has given us. We must do these things in order to keep what God has given. And that is not at all what God is doing here. They're not conditions to receive from God. They're not proof that you are worthy or righteous, and then God will give you the kingdom. But we often go there as we are saint and sinners. We store up grain in silos. We hoard things in sheds and storage units. We try to hedge our bets all the time, and it's a matter of trust. God has given us the kingdom and yet, is it real? Is it true? Will it be there for me? So we go off and chase after the wind. We go off and wander off for the things that have already been given to us. We expend energy and effort and hope that is already provided for in God. And the things that we search after and go after will not give us more security. One more package of 18 rolls of toilet paper, remember those days, will not save your life. Maybe your dignity at times, but not your life. It will never, ever, ever be enough. And that which is precious to us will become the gullum moments in our life of my precious will be strangled to death as we seek what we are already given. Where your treasure is, your heart will be. So we're asked today, where's your heart? Where have you been putting your trust? God has already given you the kingdom. And yet, we continue to search. We continue to invest our time and our energy in our life. And where we invest our time and our energy in our life, our trust will follow. Or is anchored where our heart directs. So where is that for you? Is it in your mind? I want to improve my mind. I want to understand what's happening. And so that becomes your idol. I must understand. I must consume information so that I can have a nice understanding and know what to do forward and not make any mistakes. Is it your body? I need to make sure that my body will stay strong late into life so that I will not suffer I'm fearful of this, and so I try to hedge all the bets. Is it your financial portfolio? Is it your CV? Is it your spouse? Is it your friend? Is it your work? What are the things that you're placing your trust in? We do this all the time. It's part of living. These things are good gifts from God, but when we start feeling like our life depends upon them, they become little gods for us and take away the joy of the kingdom. We are like those sheep that wander off, away from the vocation that God has given us, away from realizing the gifts that God has right here, right now for you. 
because we are people that live in fear rather than listening to the shepherd's voice that tells you there is no conditions, there is no limits to what God has done for us. But then our text, this, this tricky gospel text, continues to throw more commands at us. And it tells us now, okay, your heart needs to be in the right place, but thankfully God will put your heart in the right place. And then it goes on to say, be dressed for action, which I have no idea what that looks like. We just in VBS and we had like shields and swords and things like that. Maybe we all need to have fancy shields. I don't know. Maybe we need to have, um, well, you can decide. And have our lamps lit to be ready, to be waiting for our master to return from a wedding banquet. Your ears probably tell you, well, that Pastor Amanda is telling me I have to do something. So what are you going to do with that? We get overwhelmed by commands and perhaps offended because there's always more demand. There's always more worry. You make one decision and then it branches into five more. And then it branches into five more. And all of a sudden, you are climbing another hill. You have another challenge to overcome and it's overwhelming. But these are not prescriptions of what we must do, but just descriptions of what we will do. You need to be prepared. It's true. But when we look at that through tunnel vision, we see it as a burden, rather than as exciting anticipation of the gospel coming to us. Because it's not, uh, this might happen. It is, it will happen. The kingdom is coming, in fact, has come to you. It's not about expecting Jesus to come, or I wonder when the master's going to come home. I don't know when that's going to happen. Oh, I, I better be prepared at all times. It will happen. So as we wait for the master to come, think of it as waiting for a great surprise party. Does that feel like a burden? To wait to surprise somebody? Sometimes. Some people hate surprise parties, I see over here. But waiting for somebody to come and surprise them, that excitement of I can't wait to see how excited they are that we have been waiting for them to surprise them and to receive them into this great feast, this great festival. That's one example. Or if you've watched the movie Elf, which, you know, in July it's a good time, it's August now, but to watch Christmas movies, so Elf, um, when he knew that Santa was going to come, he's like, Santa, I know him! And he was as excited as can be that this was going to happen. These are the things that we are commanded to do so that we know to be excited, that we know something good is coming for us. Because guess what the master does when he comes and knocks? Do you think he says, is the house in order? Have you done all your duties? Are all the packages in the right room? Have you prepared a feast for me? No, that's not what the master does. That's not what Jesus does. He says, sit down, and I'm going to serve you. Sit down, I'm going to feed you. So all this worry that we have about doing the right thing, what God is doing for us is providing everything for us, serving us. And if you've been following the text, it continues to make us worried because then there's this turn. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at the hour the thief would come, he would not have let his house be broken into. So you must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. Okay, what am I going to do with this one? You are... In this turn of the story, those wandering sheep that if you knew Jesus was coming, you'd probably lock your doors. You'd probably bar the windows because you don't want him to take what he's come to take from you. Because Jesus is actually a master thief. Did you know that? Jesus is a thief. And if the owner of the house, if you all knew what uh, he was coming, instead of waiting excitedly, you, as you're probably feeling right now as you react to these commands, would hide. Because what are you hiding? You're hiding your sin. 
You're hiding your need. You're hiding the fact that you can't do it on your own. And ironically enough, because we like commands so much and we like to know what to do, we want to just do it ourselves. And Jesus, just stay away until I can figure it out on my own. But Jesus comes at this unexpected hour and breaks into your house, breaks into your life and steals your sin. And you've been preventing that from happening, trying to twist these commands into something that is not exciting because you might be enjoying your sins. I don't want Jesus to take them. They're kind of fun. Or you, are, you understand your sins. You're used to them. You're familiar with the dysfunction in your life, and I don't want to bother changing, God, so just stay away. You have your excuses, and if you can make the fact that you have these vices, then you don't have to help your neighbor. Or you just enjoy wandering off and looking for better options. So these commands are structuring and kind of cornering us as it goes through. Be awake, be excited for this. And then it's telling you you're excited for Jesus to come and steal from you. And yet we're not. Because we are awful comfortable in our sin. We are awful comfortable in our brokenness. We would rather do it ourselves than have Christ do it all the way for us. But he doesn't ask. He simply comes. Comes to you in your worry and in your doubt, in your fear, and all your vices, known and unknown, and he takes them. And he says, these are not what defines you. They are mine. Like Abraham and Sarah, who were given a promise, and they're like, okay, God, you promised, but we're going to do it our own way. Well, that didn't work very well for Abraham, did it? God did it the way God wanted to do it. And so, little flock, you've been hearing a lot of commands to seek and to prepare and to sell and to all the things. But they're actually commands that are accomplished for you in Christ. Christ is the one that finds you. Christ is the one who fills your life with every good thing. You are blessed because God has given the kingdom to you already. And so we can now here seek the kingdom not as a task, but as a gift. That I would rather seek the kingdom of God than seek my own righteousness. I would rather seek the kingdom of God and follow those commands of God than listen to the world who tells me that I'm never going to do enough and that I'll always have to hustle for my worth. Because when God commands something, it's already given. It's already fulfilled and we can delight in this so we can say, come Lord Jesus, steal my sins. I'm so excited to come to church and have Jesus steal my sins. That's what I feel when I'm up there. I'm like, I can't wait. Okay, this has been a burden. Okay, here you go, Jesus. It's, not, it's yours now. I'm excited for that every Sunday. Are you excited as for it too? To be unburdened? Well, you should be. Come, Lord Jesus, fill my heart with hope. Come, Lord Jesus, fill my ears with your sweet words. Come, Lord Jesus, and remind me that you are because you love me, therefore you give, rather than if I do something, then you will give. Come, Lord Jesus, give the kingdom because you created it, and you promised it, and you're a giver. We didn't ask to be created any more than the flowers of the field asked to be created. And we didn't ask for God's promise, but we got it. So come, Lord Jesus, as we live in faith, delighting in all that you have given us. Come, Lord Jesus, knowing that you come gives us peace. And you've come again today. You have taken our burdens and given us your freedom. Come, Lord Jesus, serve us your living water so there's no drought from your grace. Come, Lord Jesus, give us the bread of life. So little flock, I know you're wanderers, but God has got you. 
and has taken care of everything. So by faith and by trust in God, we live in this moment and into the future that's unknown. But given that what God has done already for us, we can live into the future knowing that God will continue to provide. Thanks be to God. Amen. I recommend that you open your hymnals to follow along where the music goes up and down. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, he ascended in heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us pray to our Lord for the worship of our community, and our lives. Grace your church, fill all who proclaim the gospel with your Holy Spirit. Equip your flock to speak your word of promise and hope in the midst of fear and uncertainty. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Care for your creation. Dwell among us and sustain our earth, earthly home. In places of famine, provide nourishment. In places of plenty, fashion us to be good stewards of your bounty. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Spread your mercy into and within your world. Be our helper and our shield in places torn by strife and violence in Ukraine, Russia, China, and their neighboring countries. Raise up courageous leaders to govern with compassion and justice. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Pour our love, pour your love upon your children. Look upon all who wait for your steadfast love. 
Console those who grieve and embrace those who cry out to you, especially for the family of Robert Hope and everyone who is dealing with loss. Help us to trust your promise and not be afraid. Hear us, O oh God. Be the hope of this community. Fashion our hearts to strive for the way of peace. Strengthen the outreach ministries of this congregation and all who care for those in need. Hear us, O oh God. As your little flock, we lift before you now our prayers either silently or aloud. Hear us, O oh God. With thanksgiving, we remember all who have died in faith and now rest with you. As they place their hope in you, so strengthen us to trust in your promise of new life. Hear us, O oh God. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Share that peace with your neighbor. We will now continue our worship by receiving our morning offering for the minister, ministries and minis, ministry and missions that God has placed into our hands. There we go. Please rise as you are able. Let us pray. 
Merciful God, you open wide your hand and satisfy the need of every living thing. You have set this feast before us. Open our hands to receive it. Open our hearts to embrace it. Open our lives to live it. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite Leslie and Ron to come forward for communion distribution. As you come forward, we will be giving you bread. And if you need gluten-free, just let me know. And wine and grape juice. And as, we, as you go around, if you are not yet receiving communion, you're welcome to come forward for a blessing. Just simply keep your hands at your side, and I'll know to give you that blessing. If you're at home in communing, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ given and shed for you. The table is set by your Lord. He wants to be found here, so come and find him.
Please rise as you're able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your Spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive God's blessing as you go from here. The Lord God Almighty, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine, grant you the gifts of faith and hope. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, Christ is with you.